Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. This is Jess, and I am here with a Grammy and Oscar winning, hella prolific rock icon. She paved the way for all lesbian rock stars who came after her. Hi, Melissa Etheridge. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. How are you, Jess? I'm great. I mean, there's so many places that I could start. So I think let's just jump right in and we'll kind of find our way out. Um, Sounds good. um, I do want to, the first thing I want to say is this new album that you just released, um, I'm obsessed with this concept. You basically rediscovered old demos that you had recorded how long ago? Like 25 years ago? Like when did you record these? Uh, some of them were were 30 years ago. Some of them were like 1990. I'd say it was like 1990 to about 93. Yeah. And you, these are songs that you recorded that long ago, but you felt were either too gay or too feminist, and you never released them. Yeah, they were. Um, who knows what a, you know, a 30-year-old you know, what do you think, you know, of your, when you're doing your work and you go, I don't know, I like this. I don't like that. And some of them, I, w- I just was like, well, like I, that's a little too, like, like there's a song on the album called wild, wild, wild. And it was just obviously a very tender sort of uh, love uh, a relationship sort of thing. It was just obviously about a woman. I, I felt, and I really liked the song, but I, I, I remember going, ah, I can't do that one. And then, for the last time was really just intense. And then as cool as you try, it was very feminist and, and very, uh, and, and those songs were just, I, I was just nervous. This was before I came out and I, I just, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to be something for other people instead of me. And, and I stopped doing that in like 94. <laughs> and I, I were, were there other songs? I mean, I know that you famously thought that uh, "Come to My Window." You actually like didn't think it was good enough. You you almost didn't even put it on the album, which would later like really explode your entire career in a mainstream way. I guess let's start with "Come to My Window." Like, why didn't you think it was good enough? Well, for one, I thought it was a little too vague. I thought people might not understand the sort of metaphor that I was. Uh, uh, speaking to this sort of, you know, come to my window, crawl us, you know, come, come, you know, we, we, it's, it's basically about a fight, you know, about a relationship that's kind of rocky and this sort of, I, I thought it was a little too vague. I thought people didn't, wouldn't quite understand. And, and then it was the very, it was kind of, I, it was a melody that I, that I, I was actually experimenting on. I thought, you know, what if I just wrote a really simple melody that just went up, you know, da, 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 da. I was like, oh, let me try that. And, and I kind of experimented on it. And and then it, it, there just wasn't anything to me. It wasn't like, oh, I'm the only one. It wasn't really intense. It wasn't, you know, and I, I loved all that kind of music. I thought it was just really middle of the road, which, you know, what do I know? <laughs> so just bam. Okay. Going back, you actually had initially approached record companies, including a lesbian record label, and they rejected you. Yes, indeed, they did. Yeah. How did, yeah, that, how was, did that happen? Uh, well, when I got to Los Angeles, you know, I, I read a book, you know, how to make it in music business or something. And they told you how to make a little demo and then send it to record companies. And, uh, you know, you make a little cassettes. And, you know, I, I didn't really realize that they received, you know, hundreds of cassettes a day. Right. <laughs> but and I sent it to just a bunch of, you know, it, it, there, there was addresses and. I remember I knew of Olivia Records. I knew, you know, that they were the lesbian, you know, women's music thing. And I just went, well, you know, I sent it to them and they said, sorry, but this is not our the kind of music that we have. And of course, such a joke. I constantly rib the, the owner of Olivia. Like, yeah, you had your chance, but oh, well. Who, who, <laughs> who uh, like, what's the biggest name that was ever on their label? Well, back in the 70s, in the, in the 80s, it was Chris Williams, um, Meg Christian, you know, Alex Dobkin, I think, was on it. But, you know, it was just, they were everything. And you know, Sweet Honey and the Rock, all those folks. So how were you eventually discovered? Well, it took a long time. I, I, um, I ended up playing because, because I couldn't get any steady work in Los Angeles because everyone plays for free. Uh, and I didn't want to be a... I didn't want to be a waitress. I was horrible at everything else. 
So I, I found work actually in lesbian bars outside of LA, like in Long Beach, Pasadena. So I started playing there and, and I was playing five nights a week in bars. And um, there was a soccer team, uh, some women that would come to see me on Sundays and they brought this, the wife of, a, uh, of someone in the business who, who was a manager. He actually had managed Brad and uh, Booker T. Jones and some you know big artists and and he saw me. And so he started managing me and he said, you stay, stay in these bars. I'll bring people to you. So for four years, four years, I had people come. Every record company came out to see me. They would say they didn't hear the hit. I didn't know whether, whether it bothered them that they were in a lesbian bar. I don't know. But finally, Chris Blackwell of Island Records, a producer, somebody said, you got to come hear this girl. He walked in. He heard four songs. He goes, I don't know why you haven't been signed. And signed me and that was it and didn't he later say to you like as your for as your debut album was about to be released he turned to you and was like so what are we gonna do about this gay thing yeah oh yeah it was right before it was to be released it was in the conference room you know and the all the the marketing and everybody's around and well what are we gonna do and, and i was like well i'm not gonna be i'm not going to pretend to be straight I, i'm not gonna go take pictures with anybody i'm not you know, there's too many people that I've already played women's music festivals. There's I have an underground lesbian following. That's that would be just, you know, poison. And they said, well, as long as you don't flag wave. I'm like, OK, whatever that means. Of course, four years later, I'm flag waving. But, you know, it was all OK. <laughs> so no interviewer ever asked you. That's. That's where I, I, I tell people it was like, don't ask, don't tell. As far as I know. Now, uh, sometimes I wonder if the first publicity people that I had, if they might have might have done something. I, I don't know if things were done behind my back because um, there was actually you mean, you mean to, one to, interview. To protect you. Yes, to protect me. What, what, was, the, what so. was the one interview? Because one interview, it was my first Rolling Stone interview. It was my, my first record was out. There was a little bit of buzz. And I this guy, we meet at a restaurant. He's from Rolling Stone. He's just going to put a little thing, you know, and and he starts asking me. And finally, here's a dude who did his homework to find out what this club, because I would say I was discovered at the K Sarah in Long Beach. Well, if you do your homework, you find out it's a women's bar. You find out it's a lesbian bar. And um, he finally, he said, he looked at me and he said, um, well, you have uh, a large lesbian following. You really relate to women, lesbians. Uh, you were discovered as at a lesbian bar. One might assume you are a lesbian. And I said, well, yeah, indeed, one might do that. And I thought I actually went home and thought, wow, I think I came out. I think it's going to be it's going to come out. And I was never mentioned that the, the article didn't even come out. Nothing happened. The article so never that, came out. Never. Nothing happened. So that made me think that somebody behind my back killed the article. I don't know. I'm just assuming here. Wow. <laughs> I don't know, though. But what, nobody nobody ever asked me other than that nobody ever asked me the full um the fullness uh in your voice the kind of like the gritty uh raspy roar of your voice how long did that take to develop <laughs> well when i was you know 10 11 years old singing in the church choir the choir director used to tell me i had to stand you in the back because your voice was so weird you know, that my voice just stuck out because it was so kind of low. Then I started when I was 12, I started playing in honky tonks in bars. My father would come with me. But these are places you remember they would everybody would smoke. They would smoke and smoke and smoke. So I think I got secondhand smoke, sort of smoky voice. But um, I know that I wanted to sing like. Gladys Knight. I wanted to sing like these, you know, like Otis Redding, like these men that I, I so I, I only worked on my chest voice. I, I hardly ever went into my head voice because I was drawn to that full, you know, uh, bodied singing. Aretha Franklin, you know, that that's what I wanted to be. 
Have you ever thought about um, or have you been approached at all to do like a Broadway musical based on your music, kind of like how Alanis has Jagged Little Pill now? Yes, I have. And we, we, we're circling around that, but I want it to be I want it to be really different. I want it to be unique. I don't just want it to be a jukebox musical. I want it to mean something. So, you know, I've got lots of time to for something like that to happen. <laughs> I love that. I mean, like, do you imagine it being like around one album or would it be like your entire discography that they would like write a book around? Again, I don't know. Yeah. I love that. I, I love that. I really idea. don't. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, cool. Can I ask you, can I do like a quick little round of kind of behind the music or storytellers the way they used to do sure. on VH1? Um, just like if you can give me a quick snapshot of what the song was really about or the story behind it. Bring me some water. Sure. Ah, that was, uh, I had a, a non-monogamous relationship and she uh, uh, would go off to music festivals and because uh, that's where I met her was a music festival. And she would uh, be with other women. And I knew she was with someone else that night. And I was like, oh, this sucks. So um, I wrote that song. <laughs> All right. Brave and Crazy. Oh, that was about um, that was about a girl who I never uh, who I I used to just dance with. But nothing else. And and she she was just kind of a mystery. So I just kind of wrote this. Well, if I could be really who I wanted to be. You know, I'd be brave and crazy and I would, you know, I, I would move this forward, but I never did. Now, the song about I'm about to mention is my absolute favorite Melissa Etheridge song, Similar Features. <laughs> That's about, um, well, so, okay, this, uh, this open relationship I'm in, I now meet someone else and um, we were flirting and, and, you know, getting all hot and heavy, but we hadn't done anything. And then I had to go to North Carolina to actually work on a film. And I call her and, you know, it's one of the before cell phones. And so I call her and she's not home. And then I find out she's went out with this other girl and ended up, and it was the first time she was with a woman. And so she's with this other woman. And so the whole song is just me throwing a fit about how I didn't get to be her first. <laughs> You know, I've read your book and in your book, now I, maybe this will kind of tie in together with some of these songs. In the book, you write about being in a hot tub with your partner at the time, Julie, and uh, Ellen DeGeneres and Katie Lang. Was all of this kind of dyke drama <laughs> centered around were these the songs that were percolating around that time? Because you're talking about the open relationship and you write a lot about it in the book. Oh, oh, this is not that open relationship. <laughs> That's a different one. And this wasn't, I, I, Julie was not what I considered. I, I didn't think it was an open relationship, but she, anyway. And um, yeah, then this just, it's just lesbian drama. It's just drama, drama drama yeah um <laughs> when you when you after you, sorry, i'm just cracking up i know there's a lot there's a lot going on in there i know there's, ah. a lot going, there's a lot going on um after you came out um after yes i am was this huge mainstream breakthrough how did you navigate dating as possibly the most famous lesbian at the time I didn't, ah, there's my dog. I didn't do very well at all. Um, I actually didn't, I didn't have to date until I was, uh, until I was like 39, 40, I turned 40. And um, it was not, I, I, I was totally uh, out of, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how as a famous person. There, uh, there was a, um, there was a bar in West Hollywood that was really nice at the time. It was called the, I forget what it was originally called, but they would have, I think Thursday nights were women's ladies night. I would go, actually Ellen and I would go, because she was single at the same time. So Ellen and I used to go out to these bars and we'd be like Sinatra and Dean and we'd show up. And, uh, you know, it was hard because we were obviously the the spotlight and, you know, it was, it was weird. But that is where I met my next relationship. And I know you were friends, like you talk about how there, there was this whole 
like underground Hollywood um, scene uh, or friendship uh, circle going on between you, Rosie, Ellen, um, Katie. How did you all find each other? Like, where did you guys meet? Well, we we sort of sought each other out. I know um, KD, I met KD at the first Grammys I was at. And we were obviously drawn to each other. I mean, she was there with her girlfriend. I was there with mine and it was like, ah, hello, you know, we're gay. And we just, we just, you know, I mean, that, it, it was unspoken, obviously we're gay. And um, we became fast friends then. And actually it was uh, Susan Finnegar, who was the, uh, the, she's a celebrity chef now, who introduced me to Ellen, who was this stand-up comic that she knew. And so I met Ellen that way. And Rosie, I met because uh, she asked if she could do the, she worked for VH1 mm-hmm. as a VJ, and she wanted to do the um, in-depth interview with me because I think, you know, because you're, you're sort of drawn to, wait a minute, I think they're gay. And so the four of us just, you know, just found each other and really, you know, really bonded. And of course now, Ellen and Rosie, the only ones I see anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy because you all like, what are the odds that you guys would all become I know. Would, would, would all be go to the top of your individual fields? Like that's yeah. sort of wild. Well, we were, yeah, well, we were really driven. We all of us were, you know, Ellen was man. Ellen and Rosie were two of the most driven, just like just like me. It's like I love doing this and I want to do this on this level and you know, so it's it's really nice to see that so many of us were able to you know, see, make our dreams come true. What was that time like? Like when you guys were ha- hanging out as a pack, like what sort of things were you talking about? Like, where were you hanging out? Like, what was the friendship like? Well, uh, my house was a real hub for for that. I used to have before I had kids, I had a lot I, Every day there'd be somebody at my house and this and it wasn't just uh, just the gay Hollywood. It was young Hollywood. I had I mean, Brad Pitt, uh, Catherine Keener and Dermot Mulroney were some of my best friends. You know, so writers, there were some writers. There was just this really fun uh, group of really, you know, that, that sort of cerebral fun that you just it's this constant from like 88 till like to about 95 was real, like these special golden years where we were all trying to do something. We, we, we weren't all working every now and then. So, Ooh, so-and-so's got a job. They're going to be gone for two weeks, you know, and, and, and I'd go out on tour, but I'd come back. And whenever, you know, we were all together, we would all, we would just get together and, and be it at my house. And we would, There was a lot of drinking, but, you know, we'd eat and and smoke and drink and, you know, just just have fun. I had a swimming pool and we'd often end up in the pool with or without clothes on. And did you ever reunite with Brad Pitt in the wake of like the divorce? No, I have. I haven't seen him yet. No, I'm good. I'm just I, you know, I don't know how things are. I hope I see him again someday would be really great. But, you know. It's been a while. Did it? Well, I guess let me ask, like in pulling together the material for this new album, what, first of all, I guess, what spurred that? Like how all of a sudden did you begin re-listening to your old demos? And also what, what is it like, or what was it like listening to 25 year old Melissa? Yeah, (laughs) it, it, um, well, first of all, in about uh, 2013, I was still on Island Records and I thought, you know what? I want to put together a CD box set because that was a big thing back, you know, the turn of the century was box sets. So I start digging through and I start asking, and thank God, you know, there was a big universal fire. My, my universal has my masters mm-hmm. and there was a big fire and I was afraid that my tapes were in there, but mine weren't. They weren't, there were some that was lost that are really sad. It's like really devastating, but thank goodness they found most of mine. There's some that I I still can't find, but most of my material was there. And so I, I asked for it and I got, you know, digital copies of, of all this stuff that was in the vaults. And I started listening, going, wait, I don't remember that. And wow. Oh yeah. And I remember that. And I started listening going, well, what was wrong with that song? I've got some others 
songs still that um, I would love to record that I even like better than this album because this album was songs that I of, of demos that I. I had to re-record because they weren't good enough to put out like that. But there's others that I would have re-released. What happened is I didn't, um, I ended up actually leaving Island Records. And after realizing a box set was only going to make Island Records money, it wasn't going to make me any money. So um, I got all my stuff and, and went somewhere else. Do you notice anything specific with your voice? Like when you listen to the original demos, mm. was there anything markedly different um, in your the, the actual tone of your voice? Yeah, I think I have matured as a singer. I I like to think I'm actually better. My my, my range is a little, I, I actually have a larger range. I have, um, I'm more disciplined now. When I sing, you know, I make sure I'm rested i make sure i'm eating you know the things i'm eating or you know con you know conducive to the best sort of voice so i it, i'm in better shape vocally than i was back then i was also a little um i just uh a little more tense than i am now <laughs> um you know we we went through um all those great songs I'm wondering when you are performing those songs, like especially like the deeply personal songs about the aforementioned dyke drama that you went through through these all these <laughs> through all these relationships. Um, two questions come to mind. I'm not a musician, so I can't relate to this at all. But how does it feel um, performing those songs? Like, does your mind drift back to that place thinking about that person? The older stuff, no. The older stuff, um, the songs have become uh, what they are between me and the audience. I've, I'm so far past that old relationship, those old relationships, that it doesn't hurt. I, I've actually learned so much. I can, I can celebrate it. So I can start I'm the Only One, which used to be just the, the most devastating song for me. And now it's like, oh, yeah, I'm raising my fist with everybody else. Whatever story it is to you, that's right. I'm singing for this. And it's a complete it's it's completely fun. It does not cost me anything emotionally. I love that. And um, the second thought that came to mind was, what have you learned? Like you've been in these significant relationships. Like, tell me, teach me, what have you learned about relationships? The number one most important thing is you have to love yourself just as much as you want somebody else to love you and as you love somebody else. You can't, you can't not put the energy inside yourself because if you try to make it all perfect so that somebody else is happy, you're going you're gonna to get sick. It's not going to work. You, your happiness is absolutely the most important thing. Then once you're happy, it's real easy to make somebody else happy if you're happy or help them be happy. Be an example. There's a lot. There is this um, open relationships are very pervasive in the gay community, especially in the gay male community. Based on this short conversation we've had, I've learned that it does not work. I mean, <laughs> or I guess, well, let me not put words in your mouth. Um, what is your official stance on open relationships? Uh, I'm not here to say what's right or wrong at all, because there is no right or wrong. It is all about the people. If you can be in an open relationship, if you can, uh, you know, enjoy the company of someone and intimately and then know that they're doing that with someone else and you're doing if that works, great. But you got to check in with yourself. Because, again, if you're not happy, it's not working. So if you're happy, everybody's happy, fine, great. Do you go for it? It, it could be the greatest thing. But I'm, I have found I'm definitely a monogamous, very happy in a monogamous relationship. Been over 10 years, so happy. It works for me. <laughs> I want to talk about y your your wife is an amazing person. She's a prolific writer. She wrote mm -hmm. on Sybil, that 70s show, co-created Nurse Jackie. Mm -hmm. How did you meet Linda, your wife? Linda called me in 
for uh, when she, for a minute there, she had, um, the, uh, after she did the 70s show, they they gave her a, a thing called that 80s show. And so she was going to try to put that together. Mm-hmm. And um, she called me in because she wanted me to be uh, one of the main characters that was, that ran the music store. And she really appreciated my music and she liked me, you know, and, and so I met her. And for um, years, her and I try, uh, actually wrote, uh, it, that show didn't work, but we were always trying to get a television show for me. And we actually a couple times sold it, but then things fell through. I mean, Hollywood, one, I got cancer and uh, all, all sorts of things made it fall through. But we then became super close friends for about 10 years. We were best friends. And then when my relationship fell apart and then it worked out and and um and I, I tell you, falling in love with your best friend is an a real trip and an amazing thing. And it's just the, the best, closest relationship I've ever had. Wow. And what is she working on now? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good we, answer. Yeah. We spent we spent the first years of the first like four years of our relationship apart from each other because she mm-hmm. worked in New York and I worked in L.A. And, and it was hard. And, and we wanted we decided we wanted to work together. And so, I mean, she did some other stuff. But finally, when COVID hit, um, we're like, look, let's do that. We started streaming from home. And now she now she does the streaming out here. We're always, you know, creating stuff. So we love to work together. We want to actually be together. So we, we're fine. <laughs> um, in the early days, uh, before you were out, when they would have you do uh, lots of photo shoots and such, you know, for album covers um, and just like profiles that were done on you, did they ever try and control your image or like how much input was how how much input was your look your own and how much were it was it somebody else's idea of what was going to actually sell? I asked for a little help with a stylist because I I didn't because I was wearing my jeans and my leather jacket right which works for the first album that's what's on the first album that's just me second album I was like oh you know and I, I I was a little bit more bohemian I started you know wearing vests and all kind of stuff and um right around the third album is when someone uh it was the it was the only time some of the record companies said no yes it was never enough the third album I had done the photo shoot and someone said we need to glam her up a little bit and so I took another photo shoot with a different makeup artist and it was like they kind of blew my hair. So it's funny. You, you can see like the, the cover of Never Enough is me with uh, without a shirt on with the guitar because that was my idea. I was like, yeah, you know, and um, but the the flip side of it, if you look at the back of it, is this really blown out, beautiful, like I have bangs and it's all blonde and I'm wearing this kind of silky thing. That That's the other photo shoot so it was kind of a combination of both and then when the fourth album came i was like oh no 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 i'm i'm doing this and so fourth album was that then the fifth album because we had all this money i was like oh yeah let's get you know but by then i had my style you know it was rocker it was leather and denim and stuff like that so i i've used uh i've used stylists over the years but all but i've always had the last choice um when it comes to your lyrics, I uh, a lot of them are, or m- m- many of your lyrics tend to be genderless. Um, and I know a lot of musicians do this so that they remain universal and anybody can apply. Everybody wants every song to be about them. Were you writing with that particular intention in mind versus having to actually mechanically do the the work of not incorporating gender into your early lyrics? Mostly that was the way I liked to write. Even when I was singing in the lesbian bars, I because I wanted my music to be universal. After that, sometimes I would write something and go, God, I really wish I could sing she here, but I would I would change it around, but not all the time. I I and I still write very universal. I I I just think my music, I hope my music can be related to by many. I guess finally, how did you learn how to craft a song? You know, I learned by singing other people's songs. I learned by singing popular songs and you sing enough of them, you do enough of them night after night to realize, oh, this is what an audience likes. They like they like when you get them involved in the verse 
and then you write the chorus and it's something that they can sing and it brings it home and and then you go away for a bridge and come back and you do enough you you, you just learn uh how it is is it math songwriting and music uh Music is math. Yes. I said that the other day to my my band. We were trying to figure a delay out for something. I said, God, music is math. And I suck at math. (laughs) And and here I am doing I'm just doing math. (laughs) Melissa, thank you so much. This is this is an awesome experience. Um, Tell everybody again the name of the new album and where people can find you online. All right. The new album is called One Way Out. And it is available wherever you stream your music. 